Welcome to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. On this podcast, we journey through the devastating experience of the death of a child. Grief is seldom discussed openly in our culture, and the death of a child makes people feel even more uncomfortable. We approach the topic openly and honestly, speaking to people who have lost loved ones and experts who help care for them. Whether you are a parent experiencing loss or someone who wants to support another going through this tragedy, this podcast strives to offer hope and help. Welcome to episode 98 of Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. I'm Marcy Larson, Andy's mom. So the first thing I want to talk about today is the fact that you have all noticed that I just said that this is episode number 98. That means that episode 100 is just around the corner. And I have something really special planned for that day. And I certainly hope that it goes over well. So my husband and I have been talking for quite some time about what we should do for episode 100. The other thing about episode 100 is it's going to be released three days before the three-year anniversary of Andy's death. So considering it's so close to that time as well, we really just wanted to make it something really special. So what we've come up with is having a sort of live stream question and answer session. And this is going to be on Facebook Live on my YouTube channel, which is called Always Andy's Mom. If you haven't visited yet, it yet, it is Always Andy's Mom YouTube channel and also on Twitter. So I will continue to give out information over these next two weeks. But the plan is to do the live question and answer ses- session on Wednesday, August 11th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And I'll probably go about an hour to an hour and a half and you can get me those questions and go on and be able to hopefully go in a chat and ask the questions. You can also email the questions even ahead of time so I can get some ideas as to what people are going to want to ask. And both my husband and I are going to be on. So if you have questions for Eric as well, It would be perfect to ask those. So I am very excited about it. Uh, The following day, then Thursday, my normal release day, I will just release an audio recording of the question and answer session. So it will be likely unedited and everything, but it will just be what we talk about. So hopefully you all make that something interesting that people will want to listen to. So episode 98 is our second half of our meaning making session. I'm not going to talk about that too much. It did end up being quite a bit different than I envisioned it being when Gwen and I had part one of the meaning making session, but I'll go into that when we get further into the episode. Another thing is, is that I did a bonus episode with Bryson's doctor. So Bryson's mom was episode 87, which was released on the 12th of May. And we learned quite a bit about his doctor during that visit and just what an impact he was to Bryson and his mom and even this amazing touching letter that his dad wrote to him after Bryson died. Bryson's mom read that letter and it was just beautiful and it caused me to want to reach out to him and just get a little bit of his insight on Bryson and on being a doctor to these complex kids. So my plan was to make that a bonus episode, and it's about 15 minutes or so. But I could not come up with a way to make a bonus episode without having it numbered in Apple Podcasts. And if I numbered in Apple Podcasts, then number 100 did not end up being number 100. And I really didn't want that either. So what I ended up doing was adding that about 16 minute interview onto the end of our meeting making session. So if you really just wanted to listen to that part and you are very excited to hear about Bryson's doctor, then you're going to have to fast forward a ways. But otherwise, please listen to Gwen and I and then followed by Dr. B. Thank you so much, Gwen, for coming back for part two of our meaning making kind of uh, episode. So this is a 
part one and part two. And I was really excited to do part two and Mm -hmm. to talk a little bit more about this and thinking I was going to have a lot of people write in about what they had been able to do. Because Mm -hmm. when I think about it, I've interviewed, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90 parents. I've spoken to dozens more. And the things that they have been able to accomplish in their grief honestly blows me away. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what people are able to do. So I thought that a lot of people would write in. But it turns Mm -hmm. out not that many did. Right. Only like three people. And I started thinking about why is that? Why did no one write in? And then I thought back in time to something that happened to me at my office. This is years ago. So as many of my listeners know, we fostered a teenager from Guatemala. We took him into our home. At the time, he was on dialysis three days a week. He had has Alport syndrome. It was super medically complicated. He was a delightful, great kid. He spoke very little English, really, and needed a kidney transplant. So we got him all arranged. I mean, my church helped out. We supported him. I had to give him a special diet, obviously. We got him through the whole process to get a kidney transplant, got him the kidney transplant. I mean, we got him in April and he was transplanted already by June. And he's continued to stay in my house and in fact, only moved out this week. So he's been here now five years um, Mm -hmm. and finally has moved out and is doing very, very well. Uh, So anyway, it was a lot, right? And I was at the time seeing a family in my office and they had fostered a special needs child who had, I think, heart things and all sorts of complicated stuff going on. And I came out of the room and I said, wow, I can't believe they did that. I would never be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And the nurses in the room looked at me like I was crazy, and said, Marcy, you are doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it for a second, and I was like, okay. And then I said, oh, no, but this kid is way younger, and this kid has so much other stuff, and mine's a teenager. And I came up with all sorts of reasons why what we did was much less impressive than what that woman did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, that's what happened. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All of these listeners who have done these amazing, wonderful things don't see it that way. Right. Right. They just think I'm just living. I'm just living my mm-hmm. kind of normal life and nothing that I have done is impressive. And in fact, they feel kind of cruddy about what they've done because life is hard after you lose a mm-hmm. child. So you certainly mm-hmm. don't feel proud of your accomplishments. You know what right. I mean? Right. Yes, I do. And I, you said to me, and you hadn't told me why you thought, so I just listened to your response. (laughs) And I had already formulated my own of why Mm -hmm. we only had three responses and they're very similar, but I do think that people don't give themselves, you know, it's, it is our view of ourselves and we don't give ourselves credit and we don't put value Um, Maybe we don't understand what's the word I'm trying to say in our helpfulness and our caring to other people. I can imagine that so many of your listeners have extended true compassion, Mm -hmm. who have done some hard things in their own healing to help someone else that they don't even realize it, or they, they don't acknowledge that, wow, that I just stepped out in my own pain and helped somebody else. No Um, doubt about it. it. Yeah, I just don't think you notice it and realize it at all. It's funny because yeah. I know if I would go back through, if if you were to just pick 10 random guests that I've had on and ask me about them, I am sure that I could come up right. with one super impressive thing from every single one of them. Because there's not a one person that I haven't interviewed that I didn't learn something from. Not one. Right. Exactly. And I only know a few of your listeners who have contacted me personally. And I can already think of a few moms in 
greater Chicago area who get together and talk and support each other. And they've grown from three to eight. And then there's some moms who have started a knitting group and they knit and talk about their children. Right. Um, and these, and all these people they're heard my listen plea to, this, so. to ask for stories yeah. and none of them are right. right. But I think they're thinking we're just some moms getting together at the library or the knitting group. And they're not thinking about how, um, how they're contributing and right. supporting and adding, I don't want to say value, but um, purpose to what has happened to them. Mm -hmm. It's giving them a new purpose and they're letting a light shine and they're doing all sorts of things. Um, also, I know of a group of moms who they've added to the library um, in yeah. their community to better books on how to help bereave parents, right? That's mm -hmm. huge because another parent is going to walk into that library 10, 20 years from now and mm -hmm. find that book that those moms lovingly place there, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's I mean, without amazing. a doubt. They just are doing so much more yeah. than I think people give or they give themselves credit for, really. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am going to read some of these emails, though, because I do want to give credit to the three people who wrote in. Right, right. Um, so we're going to start with Chrissy Slate. Chrissy has been on a couple of different times. She's Caleb's mom. Um, so, and she has started a great blog and website herself and an organization. So I am going to read her email. So it goes, starts like this. I really enjoyed your new podcast with Gwen. The timing was perfect as I'm in the middle of writing a new blog post titled Growing Through Grief. Your mm -hmm. podcast has been a gigantic form of healing for me. When I listened to your first episode just a few short weeks after Caleb died, I was so incredibly relieved that God led me to you and helped me feel less alone in my new world. For the next few weeks, I couldn't get out of bed until I listened to an episode. I needed to hear that mom tell her story about her beloved child who died and give me the push I needed to put my feet on the floor. I thought, if she has done it, then so can I. With no one in my family or friends that knew how I was feeling or what I was going through, your weekly podcast episodes literally got me through the first six months after Caleb died. I still listen weekly and have been able to take something away from each mom and dad that has shared their story of their precious child or children and how they survived their very painful loss. About month six is when I felt I had a little bit of traction under my feet and could implement some of the strategies and ideas that had been shared by other moms. Week by week and month by month, I have been blessed strengthened and comforted by the stories that led me to nearly 22 months since Caleb died. Hearing the stories, listening about the losses and being encouraged led me to put my pain into something. In t August 2020, one year after Caleb died, I lost, I launched a website, blog, and nonprofit, the Caleb Cares Project. The blog is my release and my way of sharing my grief journey openly, honestly, raw and broken, with the hope that others will read about my journey and see that this pain that once seemed unsurvivable is survivable. I no longer want to die. I no longer hope that I won't wake up the next morning. I no longer hate the sound and feeling of my own breath. Joy is making its appearance more and more in my daily life. I've been able to see that my husband and two daughters are worth living for. I know that my daughters desire and deserve to have a loving and happy childhood, just like Caleb had for 17 years. Through your podcast, I learned that they are worth it and they still need me. Since Caleb died, I found my purpose. Through the Caleb Cares Project, Caleb and I still show love to our community and give our time and attentions to children, youth, and families who are in desperation of someone to show that they care about them. Our motto is you are a big deal around here. The nonprofit is an outreach organization, but it also allows me to share Caleb's story in an effort to encourage parents to start suicide awareness and prevention conversations with their kids at home. Our mm. mission is to benefit children, youth, and families in our community by allowing Caleb's legacy of love and compassion to continue through us. When Caleb died, the community lost someone who cared about people and showed it every day. He was willing to help anyone, anytime, and his motivation for all he did was his life for Jesus and his compassion for people. Our vision is to give, love, and serve genuinely and authentically. 
Through us, Caleb's hands will still give, his heart will still show love, and his story will save lives. Not only that, but sharing my grief journey through my blog has been able to give me healing as well. Many people reach out to tell me how inspiring I am to them and how my honesty and journey is encouraging them through their painful trial. I think I've rambled on long enough. I love you, and I'm so grateful that Google and God led me to you. Chrissy. Oh, that is beautiful. Isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. And before you read it, I had written a few notes, and one of them was survival is part of of what our purpose becomes, right? So mm-hmm. she said that so beautifully when she said joy is making an appearance. Yes. In that survival and doing the work of surviving and the painful stuff that then we get to the joy part. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that that was just beautiful. And And I loved how she said making an appearance because she didn't just say it's there. Right. I mean, she didn't just say joy's back in my life. Right. But no, it makes an appearance. Right. It comes and goes. Yeah. It's not like her life is joyful every mm-hmm. day, but right. it makes an appearance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The other part that she said that I had written about sharing our pain and she even said it, listening to those other mom's stories of sharing their pain helped her get out of bed. Yes, I know. And then when we share outside of ourselves, then it helps us too, because we know that in grief, we have to find the words, you know, say the words out loud and find others who will listen to the words. Mm -hmm. And the Mm -hmm. podcast has done that. And now these people are going out and doing that in their community. You know, she was, I believe, my very first review on Apple. Apple podcast. Really? really. Mm -hmm. And she put, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning until I listened to one of your episodes. And that meant the world to me. I mean, honestly, Mm -hmm. that one comment made me think, okay, this is worth it. Because I didn't Mm -hmm. know for sure, right? I mean, you just put yourself out there. All I Mm -hmm. knew is that I thought... I wanted to listen to a podcast and then I realized at the time there weren't any podcasts for grieving parents. And then suddenly like randomly God puts this thought in my head, like you should start one, which Mm -hmm. seems so crazy and bizarre to me. And so it was really just going out with a little jump of faith, really, that Mm -hmm. this was something that I could do and that would be interesting and valuable to other people. And that was the first instance that I knew that it was valuable to someone. Right. from Chrissy. The other part of of hearing her talk, I thought, wow, her words are so, is she a writer? But then I realized that if a mom's listening to that going, oh, I could never write like that. I didn't hear a writer. What I heard is an expression of our heart. And I think all of us can do that. If we take the time to sit down and write it out, what would I just challenge a listener? What would the expression of your heart sound like? It probably sound as elegant, as inspirational and as meaningful as what you just read, but they minimize that in their Mm -hmm. own selves and go, Oh, I could never write that. Yeah. Your heart has that same stuff. Well, and it's funny that you say it like that too, because you would not believe the listeners that well, listeners, I was going to say the guests that I have on that are like, oh, I don't know, though. Your other guests mm-hmm. sound so great. Mm-hmm. I could never sound like that. And I'll be mm-hmm. like, no, you really can. I yeah. promise. And if you say mm-hmm. um and uh a lot, I will edit that out for you and right. and and do that. But you're going to sound fine. And what's funny is I just had someone email me who I had on in April. And she had not had the courage to listen to herself until now. Mm. Months. Mm. It took over two months for her to listen. And Mm -hmm. she said, your editing was great. I sound great. And I thought, I don't think my editing was probably that great. You just sounded great. Right. Right. And she said, I think I'm actually going to tell my family and friends about it and and really promote it because it was it was really great. And of course it Mm -hmm. was. Because it was your beautiful mm-hmm. story. And it you don't, I mean, when you are, when things come from the heart, which they do come from the heart, from all of my guests, they're mm-hmm. so beautiful. They do. 
because you interviewed a personal friend of mine. And after the interview, she called me up and said, I was horrible. (laughs) She just said, I bombed. I did a horrible job. And I said, I assure you, you You did did not. not. And she did not. No, she didn't. Mm -mm. Did she still think that after she listened? Or did she not even have the courage to listen? (laughs) <laughs> no, she did. It kind of like your other listener. Once she listened and she probably thought it was all in the editing, but it wasn't. It and there really is not a lot of editing, to be honest. It's yeah. like it's right. really taking when people trip over their words or say yeah. um and uh or like or a lot. Some of those things are taken out. But for the most part, it's just coming from the heart. Right. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, and I even look at what you're doing, Marcy, when you said, you know, you heard, oh, you should start a podcast. And you're like, what? It is that willingness to make that heart connection that you're behind that microphone, connecting with other parents and just having heart conversations mm-hmm. that you know, people ask me often, what makes me qualified to help somebody else? What makes you qualified is your willingness to go into those parts of their pain and their story. And that's what makes you helpful. That's why all these people's stories have been so helpful because they were willing Mm -hmm. to go there. Yeah. Willing to go there, willing to share a little Mm -hmm. bit, willing Mm -hmm. to just put their heart out there and to share their child, which is the most beautiful part of it all. Right. Right. The most beautiful part of the whole thing is sharing these wonderful children Mm -hmm. that we no longer have with us on this earth, but that Mm -hmm. still can give, you know, valuable things Mm -hmm. to the world. Absolutely. Okay. So I am going to read the second one. The second one is from Laura. Um, Hi, Marcy. I listened to your podcast today, Meaning Making. My son, Luke, died almost four years ago on September 6, 2017. Luke was diagnosed with stage four cancer and had his right knee amputated above the knee two years earlier. We spent those two years going back and forth from Mason, Michigan, just south of Lansing, to Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, which is here in Grand Rapids, for treatments. Mm -hmm. Of course, I hate all that cancer, the all that cancer took from Luke and me and my family, but I'm grateful for the two full years of spending almost all my time with my precious youngest son who left this world much too soon. There was much I related to in today's podcast. Almost four years later, I'm beginning to move forward in this life without my Luke. I don't feel as guilty as I used to or that it is dishonoring. If I have moments and minutes where I'm not thinking about Luke, I've experienced big losses before Luke and went went ahead to heaven. And I know if I allowed myself, I would get to a point where the grief wasn't so all encompassing and intense. Part of me did not want that to happen. And part of me knew my soul needed to have some reprieve from the deep, constant pain. I've been asking God to help me find my purpose now. I am also a caregiver. Before my mom died seven and a half years ago, I was in the midst of getting my master's of social work. I took time off to care for my mom and then settle her estate in 2014. I had not yet returned to the program when Luke was diagnosed in 2015. I'm not sure if or when I may feel drawn to finish this degree, but I have been pulled towards caring for people's hearts and souls most of my adult life. Like you expressed in the podcast, I am not afraid of the pain of grief that others experience. I am someone drawn towards those who are grieving, just hoping that the least, at least they won't feel so alone. Mm. To that end, I'm planning to begin a grief share program at my church this fall. Frankly, I'm not 100% comfortable, but I feel called to minister to others experiencing grief. I don't feel that I'm in a place emotionally, psychologically to create my, my own group of program. Um, And then she said she thought about contacting you or thought about contacting Mm -hmm. Starlight just to get some other kinds of help. But she Mm -hmm. said, still, I'm excited to begin some kind of grief ministry. I thank God for the opportunity and the ways he's created and guided me here. I know if I allow him to, he will make his ministry what he wants it to be. And then she goes on a little bit more to tell me about Luke um, and I actually, she's going to be a guest on in about a month or so. So you will hear more of oh, Luke's story then. But good. I just wanted to share that. And I thought that was mm-hmm. another really beautiful story of somebody doing something, you know? Mm-hmm. 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 And I can't tell you 
how many support groups or programs at churches or have been introduced to the church because of another person's pain and says, I, I, like Laura said, I don't feel I'm still unsure about doing it or leading it, but they know it's needed. And that that's that introduction. And it's going to be there when somebody else needs it. Right. It's, it's Mm -hmm. amazing. So, you know, I just want to, I know there's probably not a lot of pastors who listen, but (laughs) when I speak out, I just want pastors to hear that when somebody comes and says, this program helped me and I want to help others. Just listen to that. Listen to that. And, Mm -hmm. and it sounds like, you know, obviously her church did listen and she's able to start this grief share and people will come and be be supported. And it's just a beautiful circle of support. I love it. Well, and I love too, how she said she doesn't feel like she's really psychologically ready, but Mm -hmm. she's going to do it anyway. And that's kind of, that's kind of like me, right? I felt like, did I feel like really ready to do that? No, I was a mess. I mean, I, right. I, I really, but yet we do it anyway. And we right. step out on a limb and we do it anyway, because our hearts are drawn to help other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think of, you know, if we look at scripture, I mean, we, you know, God uses all sorts of brokenness and imperfect people. I mean, if we waited till everything was perfect and our life was in order and we had no scars or pains or this or that, we'd never be used. No, no. Mm -hmm. And I certainly am glad that I didn't wait until I felt better because (laughs) first of all, I don't think it would have been even as authentic uh, Mm -hmm. if if I would have waited until everything was rosy. I mean, it's, it's honestly why some books that I read on grief don't even resonate with me because I feel like people are too healed. And Mm -hmm. I don't like, this is not me. I cannot be like that. Right. Yeah. They're not messy enough. They're not messy enough. Yes. I feel that same way. And I remember when I read rare bird thinking, Oh, finally a really messy. Yes. Dark. Yes. (laughs) That's why I love that. I mean, you know, that's Mm -hmm. my favorite, favorite book. Great oh, I didn't book. know that. I know. It's, oh, no, it is. Um, it is my yeah. f- absolute favorite. And I love the messiness. And then I had another one, you know, somebody emailed me and asked me for recommendations. And I recommended that book. And it was a dad and he started reading the book. And he wrote me back and he said, I can't read that book. It's too dark and too messy. And I was <laughs> like, okay, that's totally fine. Yeah, you, mm-hmm. that's what I needed. I needed dark and messy. Right. You don't yeah. need dark and messy. That's fine. Right. Like, yeah. Then you don't take your recommendations from me because I don't like the rosy ones, but <laughs> right. I'll try to find you a one that I think is too rosy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that I just love that. And I thought that was beautiful, mm-hmm. too. And again, it wasn't something like big and huge. It's just slowly getting some healing and slowly feeling like I have something to offer other people. Right. I care for others and I can offer something to others. And I have no doubt that people who are going to listen to this are going to hear Laura's, what she just wrote and go, I can do it too. Yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. They're going to. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Okay. So now this one is on a totally different note, but I really wanted to read it. So Hello, Marcy. I'd like to be one. Oh, I should say this is from Debbie. I'd like to be one of the grieving parents who will be a success for- story for you to highlight someday. Unfortunately, I feel like that will never happen. As all I can see is a heartbroken life without my son, Braden, who died suddenly at age of 24 on February 5th, 2021. Braden had so much left in his life to do in this world. He was so smart and so humble. I try to surround myself with things or people that I want to give me direction, but I remain to be a sinking ship, missing Brayden every moment of every day. Honestly, I see no end to the pain, no joy, no progress, no fulfillment. I remain so confused and have so many unanswered questions. Thank you for your podcasts. They always help me hold on. Thank you for having Gwen on. She is so real and helpful. Please don't ever forget to acknowledge parents like me who are spending every day crying, hurting, and maybe not feeling as strong emotionally or spiritually as some of your guests. That helps me know that I am not alone and I am not a failure. 
Mm. So then I, I'm just going to write you our whole little email exchange. So I wrote her back and I said, thank you for the email. I'm so sorry for the loss of Brayden. I know that pain all too well. I appreciate the title of your email because she titled it Holding On. Because so many days, that is all we can do. We are just hanging on and taking one day, one hour, one minute at a time. With your permission, I would love to read this email out loud for that follow-up episode with Gwen. It is a good reminder that sometimes the good that can come from this tragedy feels completely impossible. That is one of the many reasons that Gwen is so great to have in my own life. On days that I don't believe I will ever see any light in the future, she sees it for me. This is the hope that she gives me. Mm. Someday, hopefully, you will see bits of hope for the future. I believe it can happen for you as it has happened for me. For now, though, please be patient with yourself. You are four months into this horrible reality. Four months. That is the blink of an eye. I honestly didn't even start to feel a tiny bit better for at least six months. Just keep taking things moment by moment and just know that it will not always feel quite this sharp. Thanks again for reaching out. Mm. Um, and then she wrote back and said, oh, I got to find, she wrote back, oh, said, thank you for your response and the words of encouragement. I appreciate that you didn't say it will be easier or better, or I will be happier later. Your phrase, not quite as sharp, sounds like something I can hope for. Mm-hmm. And and um, she just talks about how even though it's been four months, some days it feels like centuries. Mm-hmm. And obviously she gave permission for the email to be shared. So, right. But anyway, I just thought that was a good jumping off point. And I had somebody else just message a little bit on the same lines like, I wish I could be that, but I can't. Mm-hmm. And I can't mm-hmm. even see it. Mm-hmm. I can't even Absolutely. see it. Absolutely. It is... Um, so many beautiful things about what Debbie wrote and the first it's, it's so soon and so raw. And, you know, if she's a frequent listener and now with your, um, on your website, um, the category of yeah, the podcast, right. you can look at the one we did on the early days and go yeah. back and listen to that and know that we know that that's very real. And, um, I believe when we started the episode, we talked about not everyone is here, but her point is so important because when I led a support group for years and when I teach others how to lead a support group, I feel the need to tell them that their greatest job is balancing the rawness and that pain that, mm-hmm. wait a minute, I can't see anything but the pain with the people who are where joy is making an appearance to go back to Chrissy's words, or I think, um, you know, to balance those things because they're so seem so opposite. I know it, it is all part. I'm using my hands a lot. No one can see it like that moving. Now you have to go to my YouTube channel, always Andy's mom, (laughs) YouTube, and then you can see Gwen's hands, but yes. (laughs) No, you don't have that. Do you? I do. I told you last time. Oh, no, people are looking at me. No, people probably aren't looking at you. I think like three people have looked at the YouTube channel. But oh, no, because I said to you, I OK, anyway, <laughs> next time I promise I'll put on makeup, but I'm glad I didn't put on makeup. And I'll tell you why, because I cried when you read that last one. I cried because I know and I don't want anyone like Debbie to feel like we are dragging them through going, oh, you're going to be happy, you know, yeah. and your, your words back to her were so beautiful. And then she saw that and heard that, you know, she saw your heart. You weren't saying, Oh, don't worry about it. You're going to be happy someday. Um, well, that's why I felt like I had to read the entire exchange Yes, because it it wasn't, it wasn't complete with just her email. I didn't think. Um, Right. Yeah. But it was a great reminder to me that in some ways, Maybe our last meeting making episode was almost too upbeat in that, in that, like, it's, you know, and I remember you saying like 90% of people are going to get through this and feel better. And there may be Mm -hmm. 10% that won't, but the -hmm. vast majority will. And I don't want to minimize the horrible. Right. Right. 
absolutely that's the last thing I'd want to do is right. minimize this pain and the horrible feeling that we all have. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yet I, I think like in a support group, you have to acknowledge the healing too. And yeah. I think at some level, those who are in that pain, they might not know it, but they're getting hope and encouragement from saying, wow, maybe someday I will feel that way. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there was some of that in Debbie's, you know, like maybe someday, yeah. um, yeah. I'd love to talk to her in a year from now or two years from now or whatever, and see where she's at. Um, but it's so you have to sit in that pain for so long. I mean, it just. And you have to. And and that's, I wish you didn't. I mean, I wish right. you could shove the pain away and just move on. And I think some people try to. I've talked to some people oh, that have tried that. Absolutely. That just shove it away and think, I'm just going to keep working. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep going through this. And And at some point in time, when I go to dig it back out, it will have somehow just shrunk on its own. Mm -hmm. oh, it won't. No. If and you don't go through it and live through it and really experience the pain, you can't get to the healing. You you just mm -hmm. can't. And no. I hate that you can't and I hate that I can't. You know, I I was sharing with you before we started recording that I have someone in my life who is now experiencing great loss. And I'm going to be there try to try to support that loss. Um and I so wish that I could take that away, take some of it away, but mm -hmm. I know I can't. And so mm -hmm. what I know I can do is say, I'm here. I'm mm -hmm. here for the messiest of the mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other people may just give you a casserole and run, but I'm not giving you a casserole and running. I'm yeah. just going to be here, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, Marcy, I wrote on the bottom of my page as you were reading Debbie's thing that how this was used today to encourage me, you know, <sighs> your words back to her and just that encouragement of some days what I do is exhausting. I mean, it's yeah. painful to sit with people in the depths of their pain. I mean, to get up and go, wow, I get to talk to really hurting people today, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is my calling. It is what I get to do. I do consider it a true privilege in a holy space, but it is exhausting. So hearing these stories and hearing has just been so encouraging to me. Well, and probably it, hearing me say specifically to her yes, that you, absolutely. what you do for me. And absolutely. when I don't believe I can do it, I know you believe I can. And that right. can some days be enough. It's yeah. enough to know that you believe I can do it. And, right. and sometimes oh. that's all I need and all I have. And that's why I want to give that to Debbie to say, mm -hmm. you don't need to believe it today, but I do. I believe that you can right. and make that be enough. Mm -hmm. That's going to be enough for today for me to say, Marcy believes I can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And and we go back to something we said earlier from the first thing is right now survival is some of people's greatest jobs. That, that breathing in and breathing out and getting up and even deciding if you're going to put on pants or put on, you know, brush your hair, you know, just doing that is your greatest job. But when you do that day after day and choose survival, it does go from surviving to thriving. You, mm -hmm. you can look back and go, wow, I made it through and what helped me and I want to help others or just sharing my story can help others in that survival mode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think to, to just stake your claim in that um, spot that says today I am choosing to survive this. Yes, that's great. Mm -hmm. I love that. Today mm -hmm. I'm choosing to survive that and just making the decision every day. Today I'm doing mm -hmm. this. And if today ends up being a really bad day, tomorrow's a new day. Tomorrow right. you can start again. And, well, and that's and a all really right. bad day doesn't mean that you didn't survive. You survived it. Like you did the work, that messy stuff, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and even it yeah. doesn't even have to be a whole day, right? I think about some patients that I've been treating that have eating disorders and it's, it's so hard. And they oftentimes they even take like, oh, I did really bad this week. And then we're like, mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm, if you then let's mm -hmm. think about it as a day. And now I've not even done it. I told them to throw away the day. We're taking this one meal at a time. 
we're thinking about it mm-hmm. one meal at a time and you're going to try to do the best mm-hmm. that you can do for this meal and not think about the one before or the one to come exactly. think about this one and so that's really similar to this in this grief journey i'm we're not going to think about tomorrow or even this afternoon or tonight or this morning or what i just did we're doing this one conversation at a time Mm-hmm. One minute at a time, one hour at a time, mm-hmm. just because a little bit ago was bad doesn't mean it's ruined the entire thing, right? Right. I, I've never seen it, but because um, I'm done watching animated films, my children are too old, but I think it's either Frozen 1 or Frozen 2. There's a song called The Next Right Thing, and I have listened to that, uh-huh. and I have used that in some of my family who's going through a difficult time in that survival is just do the next right thing, Mm -hmm. do the next right thing, do the next right thing. And you keep doing that and they build and build. And then you've got a whole series of good stuff that you've done um, that you can rest upon. Well, and I just talking about doing hard things, I am going to have to wrap up here Mm -hmm. because I told you I'm going to do a hard thing that I have not done since um, Andy's death. And that is the first time I've gone to a funeral. So it's been obviously almost three years now since Andy died. And there was a man in our church that many people may remember, maybe not, that I actually was a singer in the praise band at church. And he was the keyboardist. And I have not gone back to sing, but this man has died now a few months ago. But because of COVID, we have not had a memorial service yet. And it's been weighing on me. Do I go? Do I not go? Do I go? Do I not go? But I really feel like I want to go. And then, of course, at the very end, all the people who have been with him in this praise band over the years are invited to come up and sing a song. And again, do I know if I'm going to sing at the end or not? I do not. I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I know the song well. I certainly could go up, but I may not feel comfortable enough to do this because certainly it it's going to be hard. I have not been to a funeral, let alone a funeral in my own church. Um, Mm -hmm. since Andy. So I'm going to try to give myself a little bit of grace. I've got people saving me a seat so I can kind of slide in Mm -hmm. at the last second. And they love me and support me. And so I am just doing the best I can do and trying to prepare the best I can. So Mm -hmm. I just want to give that bit of encouragement to to people (sighs) that, you know, you do hard stuff. And you do what you can do. And Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to make it in the church, but I guess I don't know for sure. But I think I will. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And I I want people to hear that you just said, it's been three years. Mm -hmm. Like This is not something that you're doing in three days, three weeks, three months after, you know, and some people have had to do that um, and face that. But um, yeah, it's, it's still hard. It's still hard. right? It, yeah. And the other piece is, is that I do envision that if you go up and your heart um, leads you there to sing and whatever you feel led to do, um, you'll probably have tears, right? Oh, it'll be emotional. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that too is a form of worship and, and praise as well. Well, thank you so much, Gwen, for joining me and doing this episode, even though it turned out quite a bit different than I, we had both envisioned, but still, right. it was I, beautiful. It, it ended up being exactly what mm-hmm. it needed to be. I agree with you. We're doing a little kind of follow-up episode today that I've never done before, but it's a little bit of a bonus. Just talking about Bryson. Uh, we had a great episode with Bryson's mom a few weeks ago now and you called him B and he called you Dr. B. So we heard quite a bit about you and then what was really uh, so touching to me was when she read the letter that your dad wrote to you after Bryson passed away. So I just thought I think it would be neat to hear from you and and just hear your perspective a little bit. Yeah, I, I always tell um, my residents and medical students that, you know, who you are as a doctor will be shaped by years of training and textbooks and things. But 
who you are as a person uh, and a doctor will, will be shaped by like 10 patients and, and Mm -hmm. you carry them with you. Uh, Bryson was one of those that, that I carry with me, you know, along with so many of our other kids that just, they need extra time attention They're You know, they just, they just need some, some help in the hospital. Uh, and I remember, I mean, it was kind of weird hearing, (laughs) hearing, hearing an email that my dad wrote from like seven years ago, but uh, uh-huh. or some time ago. Uh, but I think that that just speaks to the fact that these kids have an impact on people and especially people who are not like my dad's not in the medical field. So it's the only patient of mine that he's ever met. And I think it, it, and it stuck with him and my mom, I think just to, to have a glimpse because the walls of a children's hospital are sort of a special place and not a lot of people see inside of them. And so I think just having a glimpse of kind of what that world is like gives people an appreciation for how strong these kids are and how strong the families are. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's just nice. I I loved hearing that and reading that letter just because as bereaved parents, we so feel like um, our kids are going to be forgotten and we're the only ones that will remember them. And to read that and the impact that he clearly had on you and that he had on your parents who met him, like you said, one time, one time, and they that impacted them. And so it's just just amazing, I think, for parents to know that our kids mattered to more than just us. Yeah. Um, and. You know, Bryson was an amazing little boy and, and and Amanda was amazing as well and probably stronger than I ever would have been in that situation. Uh, but there are so many of these kids, you know, it's, it's not, mm-hmm. it's not just one and our hospitals are right. sort of filling up with them as medicine gets better, but not good enough to be able to keep up with them. They're, they're smarter than the textbooks are. And I, and so I always think about these kids as, you know, it's more art than science. You tweak things and you, you see what happens. You tweak things and you see what happens. And, um, you know, they're, they're helping us push the boundaries of medicine. And uh, we always carry that with us. So, you know, you can, you can think back to, I'm sure you can too, you know, patient, just patient experiences that you've had. And we are so ridiculously lucky that we're allowed to participate in this. And I think about, I've always been a hospitalist. So I've always been in the inpatient setting and you'll walk in and there are parents in their pajamas and there are parents fighting and there are parents, you know, you're walking into their world and all of a sudden you are exposed to who they are as, as people, who they are as a family, their family dynamics. You, you go from a complete stranger and then you open the door and you become for that period of time, for better, or for worse, whether they want you to or not, part of their family dynamic. And um, it's just so important that we see that for what it is rather than, uh, you know, take it for granted. Mm-hmm. You're you're 100 percent right that you do become part of it, their family. And it's funny for me. I really noticed that so much actually after my own son died because these families were, I mean, they felt so badly for me because I'm like a little part of their family. The ones that I've taken care of their whole lives, because now I'm a general pediatrician. So I'm I'm just the one, I'm the one that they go to, the one that they get advice from, the one that they've been taking their kids for five, 10, 15 years. And when they saw this horribleness happen to me, they took it personally too, you know? So I felt like they, they just included me as part of their family. So when I had a significant loss, they felt it in a way that I didn't actually expect them to, because I didn't kind of realize how much they felt like I was kind of part of their family until that happened. So it was an an interesting way to be, but you're right. You said earlier, before we even started recording that what a piece of advice that you uh, give to residents and medical students, why don't you share that with the audience again? Cause I thought that was really key. Yeah. Just, just to, 
basically just to carry these kids with you. Like let them mm -hmm. affect you. Let them become part of who you are and shape who you are. And it's so easy right now in medicine right now between just the, the, the sheer volumes of documentation and electronic records and, and my charts and malpractice. And it's so easy to forget why we got into this in the first place. And mm -hmm. we, you can go into these situations if you're having a bad day or you're already behind, you can go into a door, you can knock on a door, walk in and walk out in five minutes and not have actually done anything except check the box on your list of things to do. And I do try to tell people, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not always perfect at this either, but I try um, to, to provide something to that family, whether they are in a good mood or a bad mood, whether you can do anything medically or not, because for Bryson, there were most days, I would say the vast majority of days for Bryson, I couldn't do anything for him. And his mom knew that, mm -hmm. you know, and I would walk in and I would say, you know, how's he feeling today? And she'd say, yeah, he's still got this abdominal pain or he's still got this kind of lethargy. Or, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I hope it gets better because there's nothing medically I yeah. can do, but mm -hmm. I can show them that I, that I care that, yeah. that, that I recognize that he's in some kind of pain or discomfort. And I can show a family that, that somebody's here for them. And, and even though we don't have the answers, you hear from these families and I'm talking a lot about kind of these complex kids, although obviously we take care of everybody, but you hear from these families so often that what they really want is just, and I have two kids as well. You just want to know that the person is trying, you know, that, that they're, that they're not seeing you as just another door that they have to walk into. And, and so I think that to me is the most important thing we can do is, is show them that even if we can't fix them, we, we genuinely care about what they're going through and we'll do anything we can to help them. Mm -hmm. I know that Amanda said that when you would walk in the room, Bryson's face would light up. You know, he'd say, Dr. B, Dr. B, because he was always so excited to see you. So even if you felt like you weren't doing anything for him emotionally, you did something for him about every time you walked through the door. I oh, think. see, I remember him so yelling nice. at me to get out more often than not. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember he had this like little Nerf gun or something that he would like shoot at you when you walked in. And, you know, I had another patient at the same time who used to put a rock, I hate snakes. And she would put this like rubber snake on the top of her door. So when I would open the door, it would like follow me. It was a whole, there was a whole group of patients around that time on that floor. And it was, um, it was a very formative time for me as a, as a physician. I was, you know, I was only a couple of years out of residency at that point. Didn't, I was still kind of trying to learn who I was as a doctor. And, and those patients certainly helped shape me. Well, and I think too, in our training, we're not, they don't do a very good job with that at all, with having you, the personal side of medicine. I think it's, it's horrible actually. So I've, I've spoken to one medical school class so far. I hope to be able to continue to do that a little bit, but I know the feedback I got was so nice because so many of these, there were third year medical students and they were really feeling very disillusioned. Like they really went into medicine to help people and now they were in the midst of it which it's just studying and books and this and that and it's not about the people and about the patients and that's scary to them and it was nice i know they were very appreciative to hear from me to feel like they didn't have to lose their humanity because they were really feeling pressured to almost lose that part of themselves to become a physician yeah no. Sometimes the best part of my year. So right now I'm at Johns Hopkins um, before this was the University of Rochester. And uh, I, I do, you know, just just like all, all faculty at medical schools, we do the interviews with like the new incoming med students and like when they're applying and uh, or when they're applying for residency. And the best times of the year sometimes are just those conversations with people who haven't been beaten down by the system yet, who still have that. Yeah. You know, I'm getting into this because I want to help people. And it's just, it's so, so easy in healthcare right now to lose that. You really have to force yourself. And I've had periods in, in my career where I've, I've lost that and, and lost mm -hmm. 
lost a sense of, of what it was I'm really here for. And just kind of in here trying to get to the next patient, the next patient, the next patient. Um, and so it, it's really hard to make sure that that's something that you're paying attention to. Mm-hmm. Well, that's so key. I think, I mean, it, it just so, so important. I feel like as, as time goes on, I don't know, for me, obviously things have changed a lot because after going through my own loss, it has made me see compassion in ways that I didn't really have to think about for a while personally, you know? You know, what was interesting about Bryson um, was at the funeral, uh, Amanda was standing at the podium. There were a lot of people there. You know, there's always, it always feels like there's a lot of people when, when it's a funeral for a child. And we had a bunch of, you know, we had our group from the hospital and she goes, Amanda said, you know, she was going over the groups of people and she was like, could his like doctors and nurses, you know, his medical team, I can't remember what she said, people from the hospital stand up. And she was trying to recognize all these different groups. And so we stood up and it occurred to me that we were like, you know, 10% of the people in that room. Cause then she's like, next was like, can his baseball team stand up? Can his Cub Scout group stand up? Can it? And it's, it's funny because we only, only know them as patients. We only see them when they're sick enough to be in the hospital. And that was a, a moment for me because it, it shows you that we're fighting for something here. That's more than what we're able to see that, that we're fighting to let them live the life that, that we don't even know about. And, and it was, it was cool to see that because, you know, you can get, it can feel futile sometimes. It can feel like you just don't have any ability to fix anything or, but, but then I looked back on the times where we were able to discharge him or, or any of these kinds of patients and help him in some small way to live the life with all of those other people that were involved in it. And I think that's something that's worth remembering as well as we kind of move forward through this, that we're not just trying to help them get home to stay in a hospital bed in their, in their bedroom. We're trying to help them Mm -hmm. live the life, whatever life that is for them, whatever quality of life we can get them. That's what we're really fighting for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they can have all that other time and all those other things. Yeah. You're, you, so I always tell people, I, you know, I, I, I didn't realize when I became a pediatrician that basically most kids were going to see me and just cry. Because, you know, we get into a thing, we're going to help kids and most of them do not want you around. They don't want to see you that, and, you know, you sort of get used to that, but that's really our job is to be there, uh, you know, when they need us and then just get the hell out of there when they don't. Yeah. 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 You know, I was thinking about when just not losing your humanity. That's the point that I wanted to make, too, is that I have a good friend whose son died of a complex cardiac condition as an infant. And of course, he was in the PEDS ICU at the University of Michigan for quite some time. And they went back on what should have been his first birthday to visit the staff there. And they saw one of the pediatric cardiology fellows that had taken care of him forever. And she started to tear up. And she said, she saw her and she said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I told myself I wouldn't cry. I told myself I wouldn't cry. And for that mom, it was the most beautiful thing in the world to see her cry. Because what that meant to her was that her son mattered. Her son mattered and that she felt that as a person and that she missed them and that seeing that mom brought something out in her. And so I just think that's a beautiful thing to remember, to not lose your humanity in all of this. And that uh, showing a little bit of emotion is not always a bad thing that we're kind of don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But sometimes a little bit is okay. I think not to fall apart so that poor family is having to console you for goodness sake, but a little bit of humanity is, is nice. I think you're, I think you're right. I'm, I'm thinking of a patient recently. Um, it was, I don't know, it was one in the morning or something and I had gotten called in. I was just sitting on the floor of, of their room, just talking to them. And, and, you know, it was another patient. I didn't have anything. I couldn't fix anything. Like it was, there was nothing I could do there except sit there and say hardly any words, which for me is difficult because I talk, but <laughs> just sit there on the floor of a room and just, just be there. 
and just be there while all the other stuff is going on. And I, I hope that that mattered to her, you know, that she realized in those moments when she looks back on that, that, that people were there and that the whole thing mattered to us, that, that we weren't just phoning it in, you know, even though there wasn't really anything we could do in that moment that, that she recognized that we were, we we're just there, you know? Well, thank you so much for just sharing with us a little bit and getting your perspective on Bryson and just life kind of as a doctor taking care of these tough, tough kids. Thanks for listening to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. We are always looking for new show ideas. If you'd like to be a guest, know someone who'd be a great guest, or have a show idea, please email us at marcy at andysmom.com. Be sure to visit the webpage, andysmom.com, for more content, including Marcy's blog. There you can also sign up to receive updates via email. Together, let's work to inspire hope, one day at a time.